All right, uh, coaches, thanks um, for joining us. And a massive thanks to our panellists for jumping in tonight, uh, Mick Downer, Hannah Lowe and Tim Mallon. Um, I'll introduce each coach a little bit more in the first three questions because we're just going to throw an individual question to each of them rather than me ramble on at the start and try and rattle off all of their CVs, uh, which are pretty extensive. Um, I might just do that um, as I throw to each question. Tonight, a little bit different format to what we've had, um, less of a formal presentation and hopefully more of a discussion and thought-provoking process um, where we can uh, hear some ideas and, and ask some of the questions from, from you guys who have tuned in each week uh, to these great coaches and um, just see where it goes. So uh, looking forward to it. Hopefully we go okay and we've tried to got, get a process in place that will make it work. Um, but yeah, we'll also take some questions that come up organically towards the end, but we've got uh, about 10 to 12 questions that are set beforehand from, from coaches that submitted them prior. So thanks to those coaches for getting them in. Um, and I'm going to throw to those coaches as much as possible to actually ask the questions. Um, so it's not just my boring monotone voice the whole time. So uh, first up, um, going to go with uh, the man from Maitland, Timmy Mallon. Uh, Tim, a lot of people may not know him, particularly uh, you know, current Victorian coach and stuff that make up a lot of this call. Um, but Tim's you know, a brilliant basketball mind. He's the director of coaching at Newcastle Basketball, uh, Hunter Sports High, um, head of basketball as well uh, in Newcastle, uh, but's been in the NBL previously and long-time assistant coach uh, at Australian junior national team level. Um, it was almost a 15-year span, I think, where Tim was involved in different capacities. So, um, you know, heavily, heavily involved at that level. Long time involved with New South Wales State Program as well. Uh, I've probably missed a few things off there, Coach, but hopefully that covers off a little bit. Great, great um, hair. Great yeah. hair as well. Yeah. <laughs> Very great hair. Um, I'm going to throw to uh, Corey, who's got a question for you, Tim, first. Thank you, Rhys. No worries. G'day, Tim. Thank G'day, you Corey. for jumping on and you know, Thanks, answering man. questions. My question, Tim, is just regarding um, amongst junior programs, what advice do you sort of have for you know, your age group coaches and how they might be able to get involved with mentoring some of the you know, coaches of lower teams, younger coaches within their age group or beyond? Um, yeah, just about that sort of leadership role they might uh, take on um, as their age group head coach. Um, thank you. I suppose um, why you should do it is because everything I've ever got was from another coach. And that idea of what we're doing here tonight, sharing knowledge, helping the next person is just central to the whole notion of coaching and teaching and sharing. And I think if you don't, if you're not prepared to do that, there's kind of something wrong, you know. There's a there's something about the fundamental motivation of why you're doing it. Uh, I think that that um, the the sharing of knowledge and wisdom and passing on of what we have is just part of the fabric of being a good coach, a good club person, a decent human being. As and as coaches, we're teachers, and we've got to come out of that sort of silo thinking. And when there's someone in our club who's, who's part of it, then it can't be just about your own little group. I think it then becomes part of it because everything that I have in basketball, I have from someone else. I watched, I learned, someone gave me things. My, first, my club here in Maitland gave me a pair of shoes when I was like 17. I've never forgot it. They gave me a pair of basketball shoes because I had sticky tape around the end of mine. And that sort of act is, you know, goes on. It We pass it forward, you know. So I think that's where it's at. It's about the human aspect of it for me. Yeah. No, that's great. Thanks for that, Tim. Um, I'll now um, go with Hannah Lowe. Uh, coach Lowe is currently with the Sydney Flames as an assistant coach um, in the WNBL. Um, but also extensive experience. There's also Don Valley's NBL1 coach, even though it's not currently an NBL1 season. Um, but the Don Valley head coach, um, under-20 state coach for Victoria, 
um, being a graduate assistant at uh, TCU as well. Um, so a lot of coaching experience. And I'll throw to uh, Mason, who's going to ask her the first question. Uh, hi, Hannah. Just wanted to um, reiterate what Corey said. Thank you for taking some time to go and speak to us all. Um, you've obviously had a heap of you know, uh, experience at different high levels, both as an assistant and head coach. I was wondering uh, more so what advice you go and have uh, for assistant coaches who are looking to be more valuable to their head coach. So I guess in a more succinct way, what do you think makes a good assistant coach? Um, I mean, thank you for your question and thanks for having me, by the way, Wyndham. Um, I guess first... I hadn't been an assistant until I went to TCU. So it was a sharp learning curve. And in that space, there's five or six people involved in the coaching team, if you like. And so finding your little space in there, I found a challenge. And obviously as a grad assistant, for those that are unaware, that makes me at the bottom of that pile. Um, so sharp learning curve there. But I would say from that, from being able to observe those people who do that as their full-time career, it definitely helped me when I came back and helped with Siebel and at the moment with the, the Sydney Flames. Um, and I guess the first thing is being prepared. Make sure that you're across whatever your role is, and that might be, you know, the forward scout or, or maybe you're the defensive. You're helping with the defence. You just need to make sure that you're definitely across it because your head coach needs you to be concise in and being able to deliver um, messages to them in a timely manner because they're taking on, I guess, the broader picture of the game and you need to be able to assist them in their ability to do that. Um, something else that I think that is important is, I guess, being comfortable with being told no. You might think that you've come up with the solution that's going to solve whatever our problem is, the mismatch in the post or the, how, whatever it is. If he or she is not feeling it, that's, that's why they get paid the big bucks, I guess. And you need to keep coming up with bits and pieces to put forward and be willing to just, all right, that didn't work, move on and continue with, I guess, whatever the team line is. Um, on game day, I think the head coach sometimes get a bit wrapped up maybe in, in again, that, that bigger picture. And so you have an opportunity maybe to deliver individual messages if that's your role on the bench or maybe deliver messages from the coaching panel to the head coach. You can't all jump up and get in his or her ear and give her your nuggets of wisdom. That needs to be filtered in some way. And I think the other key element is probably you're, you're the culture enhancer. The head coach sometimes is delivering some pretty harsh messages and sometimes perhaps more abruptly than maybe the person receiving it wants to hear it. And you're, you have a really big responsibility in, you know, sometimes maybe rewrapping that message, um, obviously still staying on the, the company line, but, um, but making sure that you're, you're getting around girls or guys, getting them up and ready to go for training, you know, being that second or third voice at training and I guess basically just enhancing whatever it is that's being delivered. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it definitely does. Thank you so much for being so generous with your time. No worries. Thanks for that, Hannah. That was great. Um, great insight there. Um, now, uh, last of the panel, but certainly not least, uh, Mick Downer. Uh, Mick uh, is currently the NZNBL head coach for and Canterbury Rams, and he'll get to coach the first games out of all of us because they're about to go into a season, which is great. Um, and obviously been involved for a long time in an NBL level uh, with three different clubs, I think, uh, Cairns, um, Brisbane and, and Perth. Uh, and again, heavily, heavily involvement in the Australian senior and junior programs uh, with World Uni Games, the Boomers and, and lots of other um, bits and pieces here and there. So very accomplished coach um, and very grateful to have him on. I'm going to throw to to Waza, Warren Brown, uh, who's got a question for you, Coach. Thanks. Hi, thanks, Mick. Uh, appreciate you coming online tonight. My question uh, with the NBL, New Zealand NBL going forward, uh, your player welfare, do you, with the short turnaround with games, do you change much there to compared to a normal season? Yeah. Good to see you, Waza, too, yeah. and uh, thanks, thanks for having me, everyone. Um, I thought I'd throw, if I can get my um, chat function going, see if I can share a file um, with people, um, which is basically, just before I got on the, the call before, I was um, working through week one of this competition, because it starts on June the 23rd, 
and we've got 14 games um, in a very short period of time and, uh, and plus some finals. So uh, I was working through that process. So I'll just quickly bring that up and see it's just a PDF file, uh, week one. I can also share screen if that helps, but um, I've just put a, a small file in the chat, chat feature if anyone wants to download that. So basically, yeah, with player, play, the player welfare side of things and recovery modalities, um, how we're managing load, uh, adjusting, um, I guess how we approach each individual player is gonna be a real challenge for, for us. So uh, it's something that the team that we have here, we have a, a assistant coaches, um, a physio, a performance or strength, strength conditioning coach, a community, community guy, um, and a sports science research intern. So we've got a, a fair group of people. Now, the majority of those are volunteer, but so we've actually been using Zoom a lot to go through this um, planning process. Uh, we've got, um, I guess, the thing around how we, how we look at recover. We need to do it immediately after the game. Like that's when the shot clock starts ticking before the next game. Uh, sleep being the premium. Um, and then, you know, all the different things, whether it's the, using ice baths uh, the next day, doing active, active recovery stuff. So I am led by, I guess, the expertise of the sports scientists in that space. So literally just facilitate a meeting and a discussion around what can we do to ensure, um, you know, we're doing all the right things for guys to be able to recover and perform. So all sorts of stuff gets thrown out about uh, vitamin C, you've got collagen, supplements, eating, this, that, and the other. I hear, hear all the stuff that the scientists throw out there and go, okay, what's the most important? And it, it seems to always come back to the sleep side of things. So um, we're going to look at doing some stuff around um, like calming the mind and the quiet the quiet eye that they talk about. So once we get back from the, the games and get back to the hotel, really looking at after we have our meal and, and the, the ice bath stuff, actually spending a little bit of time of trying to help the guys wind down a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, see, see how that goes. So, um, yeah, if, I don't know if anyone's been able to open that attachment or if they've got any comments about that, but it does kind of show how hectic the, the schedule is um, that, that we're facing. So, yeah, recovery is going to be a premium. Thanks, Mick. It's good that it's basketball's back up and going. And uh, but I just thought, the, would that change your welfare now to compare to the season? Would it be much different? Or um, it's, I mean, it's the the processes are still the same. It's just, I guess, when they happen and and how often they happen. So in a regular season, you know, it's like most leagues, you have one game a weekend or, or potentially the odd double header. Whereas we're playing three games in in each week across a five and a half week period. So what it means is um, the load that we, uh, we still have a load plan going in. The biggest variability is obviously with players that play a lot of minutes versus lower minutes. So um, I guess that's the thing that needs to be addressed while we're in the fire at, uh, after the event to figure out the next day, which guys you know need uh, physio or massage as a priority and there might be some younger guys or players that don't see as many minutes but to keep their fitness up yeah. um, and so I've got in that document there as well and like there's some optional skill workouts um, lifting uh, doing extra prehab pre prehab work so there's I guess the team the team plan and the broad plan which does in, include a fair bit more um, recovery than, than normal but that's purely because of the function of the volume of games but then the, I guess the real art in it is trying to connect with each individual player to figure out, well, one, where's their head at? That's the first thing. Uh, where's their body at? Which got, we've got more expertise around supporting that part of it um, and then adapting and, and making audibles, like just having common sense approach to try and support, support guys um, through the event. So, yeah, it's going to be challenging, but there'll be a lot of, lot of time spent in that space. Yeah, thanks. And good luck with it all too. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for that, um, was and, and Nick, great response. And thanks for sharing your file as well. And coaches, if you have a look at that during and you have some questions that pop up later, um, just shoot them through to me and um, I'll try to ask at the appropriate time. Uh, we're going to get into the general questions that came through on different themes. Um, I tried to merge some of the questions together because uh, there was a fair few that came through. So um, 
The next couple are sort of around technical and tactical sort of elements of the game. Um, and I'll throw to you, Timmy, first. But um, what are some strategies to attack switching defense? Because obviously it's quite prevalent, uh, or has been quite prevalent over the, the last period, on-ball, off-ball screens. Uh, what sort of some things you can do to attack switching or you recommend? Yeah, well, obviously it depends on your, your personnel and who who you have and, and what you want to exploit. But um, I suppose with with uh, the prevalence of switching now, we're seeing it in, in across lots of levels. Um, and whether or not you want to punish that switch, obviously by that, uh, if it's, say, a, a, an on-ball pick, for me it's sort of a, like a come and screen and just a touch screen and... Um, a bit like the ghost screen sort of thing, slip it. I think that can prevent a few issues, can cause a few issues there. But also I'm a huge believer that, you know, you've got to reject the on ball a lot. And if you can, if you can look to reject it as much as you can as a guard, I really think that places a lot of pressure on the on ball defender to force the player to the screen if they're going to switch it. And the, the, the thing that stuffs up switching is if the ball handler on the on ball, if the ball handler doesn't use the screen and goes the other way, that's, you know, in my experience, you know, I've had that conversation with when we're switching and it goes wrong, you say, yeah, but you've got to send the man to, you've got to send them to the screen and that's the issue. So I'd be looking to do that. I'd be looking to go screen and just sort of touch and slip it. But then beyond that, obviously there's some, things around um, posting the the big, rolling them in, and then either looking high-low, throwing it back to the wing, and then getting it back. Um, it's sort of complicated to, to do it without the, to show you without the, um, the diagramming. Um, but I would say on, on an on-ball scenario, quite simply, is to reject the screen and encourage your players to reject screens and give them that choice yep. and, and to slip you know, to touch and slip out of it and force some indecision, breed some confusion within the defence if they're deciding to do that. Yeah, I love it. Love it, Tim. Um, Hannah, have you got anything to add or anything different that you guys might try and do uh, at WNBL level? Uh, look, a lot a lot of similar stuff. I guess the point of a screen, it's got to be with purpose, right? So if I'm setting a screen, the idea is that if they're going to switch, that I'm getting a matchup that better suits me in some way. So I guess if we're not refusing, um, I'd be looking to take advantage of whatever that mismatch that that screen sets generates for me, whether that's a speed advantage with my guard being guarded by someone perhaps a little bit bigger and slower or my big being able to bury their guard under the basket. Um, with off ball stuff, it's the same thing. Really, you're trying to set up actions where you're going to see the mismatch work in your favour. It doesn't make sense to just set screens for the sake of setting screens. So for me, knowing that the other team is going to be switching, I'd be looking to run stuff specifically to get players playing defense in places they're uncomfortable. Yep. Awesome. Awesome. Mick, um, any, any sort of thoughts from, from your perspective? Mick, are you there? Um, it's in the middle. I unmute. I unmuted myself. I'm back. <laughs> I, was, I couldn't I was, see it on the screen. Sorry. <laughs> I was having a great conversation with myself. I was on the edge of my seat. So, um, yeah. So what I was saying um, was, I think a couple of other factors is the type of switch. So um, there's teams that will come out and the defendable will like really hard show or hedge yep. to a switch. So you've got that type one. Uh, you've also got teams that. Um, you know, generally it's like pretty much of a flat sort of wall off and then the guard getting over the screen will actually get over the screen then wrap onto the, the roller or the popping popping screener. So we call, just call that a wrap switch. And then you got your stock standard, uh, you know, Wednesday night social league, just point and lazy, lazy switch. So, um, you know, Tim's thing of touch and go, I think is really good with that, that, that lazy one. Um, so the type of switch, I think, dictates a little bit around the height of the switch. Um, so if it's a more aggressive switch where they're hard showing, I think pulling the D away up the floor a little bit behind the three-point lines where you've got a bit more space to operate and absorb that, that show is good. 
If it's the lazy old switch, I think you want to set that thing on or inside the three point line so the big that slips can um, put some put some heat heat on the rim. Um, and you've got shorter angles to, to pass it. And I guess the, there was one other thing on that. Um, yeah, I guess if there's a, I mean, one thing I know, I think Bevo's teams used to do it, but you know, if we just use numbers for simplicity, if you're on a one, four middle pick and roll, and so it's switched. So now your four men's guarding um, the, the point guard. Uh, a lot of teams I know would pop, actually pop that, that big instead of rim running him straight away. And then that would be an automatic cue for the five to then come flying up and set the second on ball. So now you've got a one, five pick and roll with your four or X4 and X5 dealing with it. So if you knew a team was a switching team, then that was um, one of the things to ultimately get a, a point guard defended by a five or having your five rim run against, against a four. And you then you just choose what your what your best advantage is, which player that you actually want to want to put in the paint. So, yeah, that's uh that's some technical stuff for that. No, that. That's good, Mick. Would you have specific sets or actions you might run if you know a team's switching a lot um, that are going to put like like that example there? Would you would you do that where you have a an action you go to? You know, if they're switching like like the one you just went through. Um, yeah, so one thing, and again, I'll do the best I can without diagramming it, but if everyone was visualising that, you're the, you're the point guard out the top of the floor and you're looking down towards the hoop, um, you'd be looking at driving toward, again, reject it first, totally agree with, with, with the other guys about that, um, but if you use the pick or forced to use the pick, I would be trying to set it at an angle where you are driving towards an overloaded side, so you've got two receivers on that side, which leaves only the one receiver on the weak side. So it just puts more pressure on the single tag defender or that single weak side help help defender, a bit harder to more space to guard. So um, we had a pretty good five man last year in our league. And so for teams that switched, we would literally go into just a single one five on ball with Emmett Nah, the, the Wollongong Hawks guard. So single on ball and then driving towards that side and to keep the defense occupied with the two offensive players we looked at flare picks flare picks or or down screens with between like two shooting shooting players so that was one way to really try and allow our five man to get on the rim against the switch and then as your shooter pulls up behind on the weak side you can throw them the ball and then feed it in or you can snap it back to the top and then let your point guard attack the five man yep. but my personal bias uh, early mid clock is to definitely look at the big first because even if they don't get it, it increases space for driving lanes and there's just more things that you can do with a, with a clever ball carrier out the top attacking. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks, all coaches. That was awesome. Um, one more, and I'll start with um, you, Hannah. Um, having been around VJB a lot, this will make sense. Um, pressing's really prevalent in junior basketball. Um, <laughs> Now, what are some effective sort of press break concepts or thoughts you might have for either man or zone um, presses? Like, how would you sort of look to attack that or encourage coaches to attack that? I guess, you know, my first thought is, well, why are they prevalent in juniors? And the reason for that is because kids panic, you know, and you're going to get results out of kids panicking. And so to wind it back before I get into my, you know, world-beating press breaker, give the kids the tools and the confidence to be able to to manage that pressure because it's just smoke and mirrors. There's five of them and five of you being attacked by two guys. If you've got the, the skills, I guess, in your tool belt to retreat and survey a little bit better, you're going to find the holes up the floor nice and easy. So teaching your kids to manage pressure. So that might be one on twos or, or two on threes in limited spaces at trainings and building that up so that they're comfortable with all of that heat coming at them to make good decisions. Um, when it comes to a press breaker, I guess you're trying to force an over-rotation of the defenders, whether that's a man press or, a, or a, a zone press. And then I guess some kind of ball reversal will then open the other side of the floor up for you. And that tends to be, I guess, the common principle applied to whichever press breaker is being delivered. Um, for me, I like to keep it fairly simple. I guess at the WNBL level, the skill set of the guard means that that panic is probably less of a factor and it's more just about getting your chess pieces in the right spots 
But um, coming back to juniors, I would still say, you know, fl- getting someone flashing hard from the weak side, I guess if there's some kind of aggressive one, two, two maybe, or or even a man press and just try and get the defense to shift one way to create avenues for you to come back the other. Um, the exact X's and O's of that, I mean, you can draw that up a hundred ways, but I think nearly everybody has seen the, the classic guard split and the weak side flashing through the middle and then reversing the ball through that. Um, I guess ensuring you have a, a pressure release option is probably the only other thing I'd probably add to whatever your press breaker looks like. Like it's all well and good to want to charge up the floor, but because that double team's coming, having the ins- the insurance, if you like, of being able to pass backwards or, or release backwards, I think is important too. Yep. No, that's, that's great. I think the point around the skill development is, and, and that is uh, understanding that and building that confidence up is awesome. Um, doesn't matter what you run then. Uh, it's going to be good. Uh, Tim, um, you're obviously working a lot at the development level um, at, the, at the moment. What, what sort of would your suggestions be to maybe add to this what Hannah touched on? Yeah, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't add too much. I concur with all of that and, you know, with the, the skill development and the mentality, you know, encouraging that poise you know, to, to recognise the fact that a lot of that is to just to hurry you up and to noise and to create that sense of panic within you. So, you know, we talk about so much, we talk about like maybe labelling the options like an A, B and a C look. Yep. You know, if we can go down the line, that's our A pass. If we can kick the ball ahead, that's great. If we can't, we look middle and then we look C pass, we look back. Same as what Hannah was saying, we overload. So sometimes we just talk about maybe sort of um, categorising their reads for them as a younger player, yeah. which where to look in which sequence sometimes can sort of help them make that choice. And then, of course, as, as Hannah was saying, you know, there's a whole bunch of different things you do, you know, run the five long. And then once we reverse it, the five for us will often lift up and be that pressure release down the weak side of the floor. Um, screening the zone is a really interesting thing to do. Having the, having the three men throw the ball out and having the guards so you've got not just leaving it with the four men or the big. So, you know, a lot of teams like to run that headhunter sort of defence with the four, get it out of the one's hands, run it into the four men, let the four men bring it. And all of it's just designed to disrupt you and get you out of the, the stuff. So I would say with that idea that you do need to be prepared to be able to get into your offensive alignments and schemes through a player other than your one, especially if you know you're going to come. So if that's like, okay, if that happens, then we just go and into dribble handoff with you. Or if we throw it to the five, you'll scoot around and get a handoff. So, you know, recognising how you can, you know, get into the schemes and shapes of offence that you like. And I do think that, and I'm not sure what, it'd be interesting to see what Hannah and, and Mick think about this as well, but, I do think we're a bit preoccupied in Australia of running pattern transitions. Whereas in Europe, it's really not the way of basketball. Let's just get the ball, occupy the middle lane. And if they happen to just take their time to get it up there, once they're there, then we'll run stuff. You know, we seem to be having to think that if we don't run down the floor in a very precise shape all the time, Mm. then we're out of it. And that tends to freak us out a bit. And I think... My personal view is that, you know, I've certainly tried to move away from a lot of that yep. in my own coaching. Um, some sort of, um, I think that causes some trouble because, you know, if suddenly the, the recognisable typical shape isn't presented to us, then, you know, we're, we're tripping out. And, yeah. uh, so, you so know what just to unpack that a bit more, you're talking about like running the traditional floor spots and lanes, you know, five yeah. and two and three after you run in the... You know, the outside lanes. Is that what you're sort of touching on? Maybe. Yeah, I think so. I think so. You know, in one of the things that, you know, and again, I'm interested by the other coaches, one of the things that the European system and and in cadet basketball and junior basketball is they're very good at putting their four in different spots on the court. Mm -hmm. And this causes a lot of issues for a lot of teams, especially when, you you know, you're you're tagging on pick and rolls and things. I'm not sure what other people, what other coaches think about that. Yeah, just to maybe maybe echo some of those thoughts that Tim was talking about the um the that idea about I mean I know it's going to come up later about positionless basketball but 
just the idea about what players on your team are good decision makers and have good skill, irrespective of whether they're five foot five or six foot five. Yeah. Um, so I think, um, yeah, moving away from, I guess, a numbered structured approach to more around um, teaching kids and putting, I guess, the best kids in the spaces that are the main decision makers when they're dealing with extended pressure up the floors are a big one. And, and something that Hannah um, said really stood out when she talked about uh, the one on twos at practice is I think it's a bit of a chicken and the egg thing. You can have a really, really skilled kid, athlete who can pass the ball, you know, play out of a stance, but they make poor reads. Or you can have kids that read the game well, but have really poor skill. Yeah. And so, which, which is the worst issue because you need both to be able to read the game and then execute the skill at the right time, namely the pass or running and catching in the air on the move, which is another skill that kids, you know, really lack these days is, is footwork and timing and leading. So um, I think um, being able to encourage poise, as, as Tim put it, well, poise will come with confidence if you have the skill to be able to actually do simple things, run, understand an angle to, to cut to, and to be able to catch the ball in the air and land in a stride stop or with balance, you know, to then be able to do the next thing. So, so uh, reading, reading and skill execution is really, really important, regardless of, I guess, the tactical yeah. um, side of things. No, that's great. I think uh, all coaches, um, you know, the, the, uh, the three of you that just commented, um, None of it was, here's the exact special source press break that will solve all your problems. It was basically getting back to the fundamentals, the skill set, the decision making and all those things. So hopefully the coaches can take a lot out of that. And obviously they're going to need some framework in place, but that's not as important as all those underpinning um, factors and fundamentals that are going to make sure that they can be effective. So um, that's great stuff. Um, I'll roll into the next one um, with uh, Jason. Thanks, Reese. Um, my question actually probably ties pretty closely back to what we're just talking about. Um, ball screens are used a lot in the modern game at all levels. I'm interested in your thoughts, I guess, on how we teach junior athletes those sort of more structured parts of the game, but we still skill them up with the ability to create for themselves when the time's right. Uh, any, any of you guys can go first. Um. I'll, I'll, jump, I'll jump in. Uh, I think, so sorry, so it's particularly around the ball, the on-ball screen. Is, is that what you want to? Yeah, I think that was the question yeah. around the ball pick, yeah. Yeah, um, I think it's important, because it is prevalent, there's no doubt. Everyone watches the NBA. That is a different game to the rest of the world. But even in Europe, it's prevalent, and, uh, and even in the Australian NBA. So kids see it, and they want to... Uh, emulate their heroes and be able to do things, mimic mimic some of the plays that, that those players make. So uh, when it comes to trying to explain to your playing group, I guess, how it, how does it fit into the overall plan? So understanding, you know, press breaks and, um, um, you know, whatever your staple half court stuff is, playing out of receiver spots, what part does the post play? Like there's there's different elements, I guess, to your, your style of play and, and the things that you run. So... That's probably one thing is to, to talk to your group around it's important, but it's one piece, important piece of many important pieces across your overall plan. And then I guess the thing with the, the pick and roll stuff is the whys and the what, like what's the actual desired outcome on it? And I think um, when I observe coaches and watch, watch kids play, I think they feel like the two players involved in the pick and roll um, you know, a, a winning outcome is if one of those two get a bucket. And like having a pick and roll essentially is an action to create an advantage. And that advantage may be quick and terminal and lead to a shot, but it may force a help defender or a weak side defender to overcommit, which then obviously creates um, space or, or, or opportunity. So the whys and the what around... Um, you know, what your outcomes are when you're trying to run a, uh, a pick and roll is really important. And then I guess the context of it, like when do you run your pick and roll? Is it early in the shot clock? Is it all through the shot clock? Um, or is it early and late? That's my preference. I don't mind early on balls and, and late on balls if we've got the personnel, but um, middle of the clock generally, let's let the ball move a little bit and, and, and see some see some air time. 
And then I guess the last part is teaching kids skill. It comes back to skill. Like how do you actually execute, um, you know, good footwork and screening and the angle of the screen, um, you know, ba based on coverages. So there's so much to it around the hows of how you read the game and then the actual skill that you, you need to, um, to execute. So I think um, there's so many layers to it. So in dealing with young kids, or younger athletes that under 14 and 16 age group, you've got to keep it, keep it quite, quite simple. Um, and so one of the things I've tried to do is really dumb down the whole approach to using screens and defending them. And that's um, relating it to, to four logical steps with a screening action. So the very first thing I say is the receiver, whether that's the dribbler in a pick and roll or someone off the ball receiving a screen. So the receiver of the screen can always reject. So I know we've already talked about that. So they, they have the first rite of passage and it's a bit like a tennis match. So that's, that, that's the serve. They can reject it. If they choose not to reject it and they choose to set up the use of the screen, now they're handing the rite of passage over to the screener. So the screener now has the right to make the decision. So the screener can slip if they feel like slipping is the right, the right action. But if they don't slip, then they're committed to setting it. And so if they then set the pick, they're handing it like the tennis match, they're handing it back now to the player with the ball. And then the, the player with the ball, the playmaker, will attack the coverage. And then hopefully you've covered off on, based on some simple coverages, how you would go about attacking. Um, so they attack the coverage and say, so once they've done that, now that may lead to, you know, turn the corner and lay it up. It may a little drag dribble to, to, to draw a show defender, but whatever you've taught there, the, the player with the ball attacks the coverage. And then as they're doing that, they've now handed over to um, the screener again to read and respond or read and react to that, to that attack. So they're the four steps. It's a long-winded thing, but um, the, the playmaker can always reject it. If not, the screener has choice to slip. And if they don't slip, they set. And then the playmaker attacks coverage. And then the uh, the screener reads off the attack. So that's sort of, I break it down in those logical um, sequences for younger kids and work, work on the skills associated with each with each area. Sorry, that was a long answer, but pick and roll. I mean, we could spend, <laughs> how long could we spend talking about pick and roll? But anyway, that's some, some concepts. Thank, thanks for that, Mick. Um, Hannah or Tim, did you want to add anything else around sort of the balance of becoming too ball screen centric or... And that is with young kids and teaching those other elements that might be passing, cutting, spacing, receiver spots. What you got any thoughts on that? Or I think, yeah, for sure. I think that. Am I muted? No. no All right. I think that keeping it simple is probably the key thing, which I think we've we've already just gone over. You want your kids to be able to make a play, and I guess also in juniors, whatever system or you know, position, whatever it is that you're doing with your team, you want kids to be able to go from your program to the next level up and be able to fall into whatever it is that that guy or woman is running at that level. So you, there's a bit of onus on yourself to not just run pick and rolls to death because that's what's going to work for you, but for your kids to also have an understanding of what other actions might be out there so that the coach can walk in and talk about a floppy action and the kid knows what, what that's going to be like. But also, as we've just gone into a little bit, um, what everybody else is doing and what the options are, it's not simply just to pick the kid with the ball makes a play and he can either shoot it himself or pass to the roller and the game's over. There's so much more to it, hence that we could talk about pick and roll for this entire thing quite happily. But I think as the coach, you've got a massive responsibility to make sure you're running some stuff with different actions in it. Um, obviously maybe tailoring that to your group. Um, and then I would also say defend, spending time defending the action. You know, you're going to get better at the pick and roll and all of these other things the more time you spend learning to defend it, whether that's icing, hard shows, switching, flat show, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, but spending the time learning to defend those actions will make you better at being able to make a play in any, inside anybody's system. So I guess in short, diversify your offense because it's going to help your kids be better players and be able to transition to other people's programs better and make sure you're teaching them to be able to make a play. Cause if you can't make a play, yep. you know, 
Brilliant. Timmy, anything to yeah, add? I, I, do, I do want to say something about this, and I think it's really important because, I, and as Hannah said, and, and we all know, I think it's a really good question. I think it's a, a, an exceptionally important question. I think as a developing coach, this is a very important area for coaches to think about a lot. And as Hannah said, to make sure that, you know, you can figure out a way to defend this and to use it. I think you've got to figure out a way of using it for more than just the one man, the ball handler. I think there are ways of, and again, if you run a, a zipper action or an Iverson cut action to get another player to get a catch in a spot where now we can go pick and roll with a different player. I think that's a really nice way of doing it. I'm a big fan of, you know, a zipper cut action or a shallow cut to a lifting on ball for more than the one, you know, I think sometimes we tend to, it just, now the other kids space out. So I do think from a coaching perspective, it's very important that you get across pick and roll and you research and you think and how to, how to coach as Mick was saying, get those ingredients, get steps, I mean, I'm an English teacher and I'm still figuring out how to teach writing. Writing, that process of what can I do? How can I teach this a little bit better? And it's part of what I love about coaching basketball because I'm still searching for how can I teach that a bit better? And I'm making notes here from the other coaches tonight because I'm going to take that, I'm going to use it. So that, that idea is a really important uh, thing. And I just want to pick up on one more point of what Mick said and... and um, I might shut up for a bit then. Um, I work with a great coach. I was very lucky to work with a coach called Adrian Hurley. Now, those are, those are the coaches there that don't know who Adrian Hurley was. He's, he coached the Australian Olympic team and coached Perth Wildcats and founder at the Australian Institute of Sport. I was lucky to be Adrian's assistant for about three or four years. And <clears throat> I'll tell everyone how Adrian Hurley coached. He coached by narrative. He told stories about the team. He would come in and he would say, this is what our team's story is. And as Mick was talking, and Mick said, um, how does it fit into your plan, to your style? Well, you've got to consider the story of your team, which means where we get our shots, we'll run them here, we'll do that. Hurley was an amazing storyteller. And I think a lot of those old coaches were... Lindsay would tell stories, what, what Gideon told, and Simo would tell me about Lindsay. They would tell these stories. So you coach by the narrative, and your, your players want to hear the story of your team. And part of that story is pick and roll. <laughs> and in the modern game, and, it's, and it's, it's a responsibility to show them, but then to show them how to run a shuffle cart and a flex cart you know, and use flair and you know, to play some of that. And now they go, oh, what's a UCLA cart? And in a way, then you can give them a bit of the history of the game. And, you know, we're really educating them to it. But the pick and roll is very important. We can't just say, you know, it's, oh, it's ruining the game because it's part of the game. Uh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, uh, one quick thing to add on that. Go. One of my favourite things, what Tim was just saying, is if you kids love the NBA or WNBA and so they see an action like maybe um, the Greek Freak you know they got some little action there, or there's something called a blade, a blade cut now by I can't remember the noise, like Joe Crowder or something. But anyway, so the kids get excited about an action, and then you're sitting there going, oh, okay, yeah, that's um part of the the shuffle or the old prince and off or something like that. So um, having a bit of fun around the current and what motivates the kids, but also I guess educating them a little bit about the history of where perhaps that, that offense or that that action has come from. Um, I think so. Thinks a really, really cool thing for for young people to actually have an awareness that the game, everything right now is not brand new. Yeah, you know? it's just it's just pitched and marketed way better maybe than what it was a, a while back. No, that's fantastic. Um, we'll, we'll get into the next question, and it's from uh, it's around coach mentoring and development. Now, there's a couple of questions sort of around that, um, and it's from our uh, first one's from Grant Duca. Hey guys. Um, just wondering what kind of knowledge, trades or skills that you think is critical for coaches at all levels, regardless of juniors or seniors? Okay. I'll have a go. Um, yeah. I, I think first up, willingness to learn. I think as the guys touched on just before, nothing that you're seeing on court now is, is new. It's all, well, nearly everything has been done before one way or another. And I guess your 
you don't want to come into any coaching or basketball situation and assume that you've got all of the answers already. Um, I think being willing to learn is probably the key thing. Um, you're going to pick something up, whether you like it or think it's not something that fits your philosophy every time you hit the floor. Being proactive, you know, get out there and help. Go and ask questions of people that I guess have more experience than you or in the position that you'd like to attain. Find out what they did to get there and then get around doing that in however that works for you. Challenge yourself with your younger groups, with new drills, different strategies that you might see in the NBA or the kids might bring to you. I think sometimes when the kids, you know, get enthusiastic about it and come to you with something that they might have seen, you know, the, the 76ers do, incorporating some of that in improves the buy-in and also tests your, I guess, skill levels, be able to apply new things to the offense you were previously comfortable with um spending time listening to podcasts i've been doing a lot of that lately because coronavirus so i found that to be to be really great giving me an opportunity to get a window into i guess coaches that are otherwise you know i struggle to find the time to to do i'd struggle to get to um coaching clinics as it is because of work so i found that to be something to help me enhance my skill sets find yourself a mentor um, and ask them questions, you know, you'll find that the coaching community, or I've found so far, people are so willing to have you. Before I worked at TCU, I found the assistant coach at Oklahoma and an assistant at UCLA on LinkedIn. And I just emailed, I'd never met them before um, and asked if I could come and watch training for a week. They let me into scout. They let me, they were as part of the whole process. Um, it was amazing. And there are people at all levels that will do that for you. And the only other thing I've got is watch a lot of basketball. <laughs> lots lots and lots and lots that's it Tim Mick you want to go <laughs> <laughs> I don't know to, to, to I don't know how discreet that uh, relationship was Tim with what you were doing helping us um, but I've brought it up a little bit anyway Tim, Tim I do know has mentored a lot of people um, and so I'm sure he'll have some stuff to share, but yeah, just to add just a couple more things on to, to what Hannah was saying, which was, was absolutely all, all agreeable. I think one of the things that um, I'm investing a bit of time in is this thing around mental modeling. So um, when it was, if anyone else is doing it, feel free to jump in too. But obviously in this information age and the amount of processing that people do with devices and just so much information that's available, like the way people learn or, um, uh, exposed to the volumes of information is way different now. So there's this this movement of kind of understanding around um, filtering the process of filtering out noise to really have targeted and guided learning. But the key to that is you've got to have an awareness or a bit of direction around what maybe you need as a person and a coach to improve on. And I guess that's where the mentors come into play. And so. Uh, we've got a mentorship program here with seven scholarship coaches in Canterbury and um, uh, all, all adults. So it's all, all an adult learning program. But one of the things that um, we've got with their coach, we call it a coach investment plan, is we started with a, 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 a self-evaluation. And then that self-evaluation, either in its full or um, broken up, uh, the coaches were asked to take that to someone that would look them in the eye and give them honest feedback. And so I use the example with the coaches as if I want an honest opinion, I just ask my wife If she's black and white and she'll tell me whether I want to hear it or not. She will tell me the truth. And so there's things around um, my coaching development um, that my wife can really help me with. And then there's obviously other people around technical and tactical stuff like Andre Lamanis is a, is a big one for me and another gentleman by the name of Bruce Palmer, um, you know, great basketball mind. So your mentors can be, really informal. Dr. Adrian Hurley's another one. He's, I, I'll, I'll ring him if I've got big life decisions. I'll, I'll, I want to bounce off him. So, and he'll give us a, a long story um, and, and, and an analogy. So understand, uh, having a small group of people that you can trust and, but are not going to tell you what you want to hear, but tell you the truth that can then guide, I guess, the areas that you should prioritize your investment in. And then this mental modeling thing is around you know, actually resisting the temptation of all the noise and really locking into like who is the best in the industry at that particular thing that you want to learn and spending enough time to, to learn about that thing, whether it's how to learn match up zones, how to do conflict um, resolution or whatever. And then the last thing to close it off is once you invest that time in learning, 
there has got to be a period of time where you've actually got to be able to reflect on it and then apply it in the field. And I think that's the other challenge we have at the moment because I'm, yeah, I love podcasts and there's so much stuff on the internet and you're kind of like absorbing all this, but when can you actually sit back, take a breath, assess it, and then go, all right, what am I actually going to apply? What's realistic to apply in my program? What can I put on hold for when I coach a different group later? What's actually relevant to, to this group? So I think that part of it's really, really important as well. Sorry, mate. I love the game. I love talking. So just tell me to shut up. Do one of these ones. <laughs> that was great. Um, really good insight. Tim, have you got anything you want to add on that sort of traits of a coach? or? Oh. Yeah, well, I think, again, um, I th uh, thanks, Grant. Gr Grant, is that sort of answering your question with that? Yeah, definitely, um, in a wide range as well. It was, yeah, pretty much just for all coaches and how we can continue to develop. Yeah, okay. So, and make no mistake about it, I mean, and, I'll, and Mick, Mick made a point. So, uh, my friend is Andre Lamanis, and so I work with Andre with the national junior team. And Mick obviously worked with Andre professionally, and um, and Andre and I have had a relationship for quite a few years. And as a mark of how good a, a coach he is, he did what Mick was saying, and he would ask me, you know, as a friend, to say, "Okay, let's just have a, a chat in and check in about the games." And he would he would really encourage me to tell him truthfully if I thought he was coaching, you know, his body language. Things like, you know, I'd say, yeah, I reckon you sat down and then you stopped coaching. You know, you're pissed off with that call and you you went and sat down and there was a period of about a minute and a half, I reckon you stopped coaching your team. And he would he was open to that sort of stuff. Now, if a coach like Andre is open to that, that just says to how much as as Mick and Hannah, getting that feedback, getting feedback is helps you change, helps you modify, helps you grow. You you've got to have feedback. All students need timely effective you know and often feedback which is not just truthful but it's also thoughtful so the people that you deal with that give you that feedback you know you know that's really important and i think if you're going to be uh pursuing your career in coaching and and at the whole time is seek out seek out feedback and and i think hannah and mick both said it once you you seek out that knowledge and that feedback then it's a matter of applying it isn't it? It's like, how can I give this a go? But not having too thick a skin, not thinking, not being totally up yourself all the time, thinking that, you know, you know everything because it's just not true. And you've got to, you've got to be open to listen. As Hannah said in the first comment about her when she was at the, the, uh, the college, you know, listen. And if they don't like what you hear, then that's okay. Don't take it personally, you know, You've got to be able, you can't have too thick a skin in that game. So, you know, I think that that was that mentoring thing is so important. And it's a mark of a mark of maturity as a coach to accept feedback and a lot of that. And sometimes it'll be, you know, it'll be a bit difficult, could be a bit uncomfortable to hear um, how you handle pressure if you are, if you got too emotional on the sideline. You know, if you really lost it and you, you're into it with the refs and you forgot about coaching the game. I mean, what coach hasn't done that? And sometimes it needs to be said to you. Someone needs to be able to say that to you. So you've got to be, you've got to be open for that. Fantastic, um, coaches. I just it sort of leads well into the next question from um, Tom Pottinger, which is, um, how do you diplomatically tell a coach if you're in a leadership role in an association or a club? How do you diplomatically tell a coach that their session has too much uh, of their time talking and the kids standing around bored? How would you approach that sort of situation? Um, I might start with you, Tim. <laughs> how, do you, how do you diplomatically tell them? Um, I suppose you could you know, look. I was just wondering if you perhaps shut up a bit. You know, like, but, you know, you know, put a sock in it. Um, um, if you, he could notice that the players are all gone to sleep or they're cold or they're putting their jumpers on, <laughs> putting their dressing gown on. I don't know. I mean, truthfully, I mean, it's just sort of one of those things diplomatically that probably part of it is to implement that idea beforehand. So when the coaching planning meetings to say, this is what a good plan looks like, once you're going, 
you keep going and then you know you you're timed try to stick to your time limits in your practice and you won't have time to you know go go off script so much so i think probably the answer for me would be to be nice you know be 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 um considerate about it and be tactful i mean we're working together there's no point in just you know just going and barging in and being rude to people um but i would say that where you're really effective is you you outline that those expectation what a good practice session looks like beforehand you know in your pre-meetings and this is what a practice is like and then if they need that gentle reminder then you give it um that's the way i would that's the way i would approach it yeah right. um hannah or mick you want to add to how you sort of approach that situation if you're in that leadership position I guess I'd probably get into things like, you know, in Australia, our court time is so limited. Your time with your team is precious. You want to maximise the amount of time they're actually active. Um, and then I think the point about your training plan and having time allocated, even running a clock so that you can sort of, you know, I've only got eight, ten minutes to this drill or six minutes. I kind of need to get them going and get good at teaching on the fly. I mean, I think about kids you know, games you've, the, the coach giving a bit of a, a 20 minute razzing after a loss, you know, often that razz or that communication space is a little bit about me and my frustration rather than the kid. And I guess remembering or trying to keep your communication to what's important rather than what's making you feel good in the moment. Perfect. Nick, you want to finish off with anything there? Yeah, just, just one thing just to add, add to what's been said was, um, I guess it, come, it does come back to the very start of it around, I think Hannah talked about the previous question around willingness to learn. I think it's also the mindset of coaching, um, irrespective of whether you get a paycheck or not, which is very, very few people in the coaching game. Do you believe that coaching is a profession? And, and it's a set of behaviors and professional behaviors that are executed in, in the environment that you're in, whatever that is, club basketball, um, uh, your state team or, or your NBL one team. So if you, if the coach that um, you're working with or you feel like um, needs some feedback, I guess it comes back to just having a discussion with them away from the court around how do they perceive their coaching? Are they just, is it just a volunteer act and they're downplaying, I guess, the importance of their role? Or do they truly believe that, you know, they can make a difference, volunteer or not, that, that it's a craft that you work on? And one of the most important things, like what Hannah said, with lack of court time and all that stuff, is that your craft is all around how, how you best utilize your resources and get the best out of people. And so being really efficient with your time and use of language and succinct language. Um, staying the course with your practice sessions, all that stuff is just part of the craft. So if someone is, I guess, ignorant or, you know, not really interested in receiving that sort of feedback, then um, that is definitely going to hold them back. But I mean, I'm too black and white when it comes to, to that stuff. I, I don't know if I'd be able to be diplomatic with it. I'd hope the issue was addressed as part of their plan as becoming a, a really good professional first. And then it's just a little bit of feedback on the fly as opposed to a, here's a stopwatch and going, shit, you were active for 18 minutes out of a 60 minute session because you you heard your voice for the rest of the time. So. Yeah, yeah. no, that's great. That's great. Uh, and thanks to Tom for that question. Um, now going to get into some, a, qu a quick question on film. We had a couple of around film, um, but I decided I wanted to get three Maitland Mustangs on the same Zoom call. So I'm throwing to Cal Wade to um, ask that question. <laughs> Uh, hey guys, uh, hey Timmy, how are you mate? Um, so just wanted to ask a question around film um, and specifically how you guys approach um, the use of film in your own programs, um, both in a player review sense and, and in a scout or a game preparation sense. I reckon Mick. Yep. <laughs> Actually, I do have a two minute scout video that I just randomly pulled out of last season. So. I know video can be a little bit hit and miss. Um, I'm happy to share screen and yeah, watch a little bit and talk to sure. it. Just a change up. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to try that and then we can just, just talk to it. So this was... Uh, give me a second to get this sorted. 
Uh, what does it share screen? How's that? Is that? Yep, that's, that's cool. Tough? Fine, mate. Um, so a couple of things. The uh, the old Greg Popovich telling his Spurs staff back in the day when Brett Brown was a coach that when they came back from the uh, the summer, they had to turn their scouts from three minutes to two minutes forty five, like um, which you know. And Brett was funny the way he explained it, but you know they were every second cutting in and making sure that they minimise the amount of video time, but. I mean, smarter people than me and educationists would tell you, obviously, how people learn and their concentration and all that stuff. So it's important to be short. If, uh, and I'm just going to talk about the Game Scout video, not, not reviews or, or individual stuff. So Game Scout video, I think, has got to be consistent with, uh, um, I guess, the narrative of the game. Like going into a game, what uh, the foundation things that you do, what are you prioritising? So... The context for us is it's a league. So we actually get, you know, a fair bit of preparation time. So when you look at this video, we have our own language document. We've got three to four practice sessions a week leading into it. So um, if it was different and there was a shorter lead in time, um, maybe the language is presented a different way. And then the other thing just to raise is it depends on the opposition. So if we play a certain team, they may be a bit more of a motion-based team or a flow-based team that just plays out of concepts. And so it's more looking at a couple of their main actions that they that we feel like need to be dealt with as a priority. And then the rest you trust. You're, uh, you trust your preparation and trust your in-game in -game instinct. Whereas there's certain teams in our league that they play like Europe, they have a whole bunch of sets. So you can't cover every set and every, every possible... Um, possible action. So this video here is halfway through the season. Um, I'd say this is like the second or the third time that we're leading into playing, who is it? Uh, the Southland Sharks. So um, let me know if I need to change the speed of the video if it's, um, if it's a bit, bit blurry. So there was 10 clips 10 clips of offense of the other team and six clips of D. That's how we summarized this whole, this whole game. I don't want to rail ride the whole, uh, the whole conversation um, around video because we could get lost in a rabbit warren. So I'll try and be quick, but if you see anything and you want it stopped. So we've already played this team once and now it's just a matter of um, revisiting some of the things from the first game. So there, up the floor, gets action. That caused us a bit of grief in the first game. So there's just a couple of clips there. And then the language that you see, the word wall, the word hunt, that's just part of our, our language. So um, it's not so much about the play call, it's more around our players recognising, um, you know, actions and being able, to, being able to deal with it. So when I reference um, the, the wall part of it, We're talking about this big here, like being up and walling it off. And then the hunting part is in reference to these defenders off the ball. Pick and roll, hunting off the ball. So again, we just highlight some of the key skills that are going to be required in this game that are going to be important across the 80 or 90 possessions. We're going to see a bunch of common actions that, we can, that we're going to have to be good at. Um, Let's get to the next one. So that was their get stuff. So out of their whole transition for Southland, that was probably the main kind of package of, or main sort of part of their, their family of transition stuff. That was, you know, hey, we got to deal with that. And then head tap, um, which is a pretty common set by a lot of teams, um, is, is one of their staple half court things. So we address something in the full court and then now a couple of the main things they do in the half, the half court. And so this clip, like the thing around hunting off the ball. So you see um, Emmett Nah, like we chase. That was our one of our foundation rules, you know, so chasing. So he chases well here. We've got a really good wall, a high wall into drops. And then Adam Gibson, who's the defender off the ball here, does a good job of tagging there and then recovering with a high hand. 
So when we present the video, again, it's just keep just laboring the point around our, our language, our basic concepts and guys seeing good execution of that. Uh, and hopefully we have video. Uh, I'm a big believer in not showing a highlight reel of the opposition. There's no point, like you expect the other team to be good um, and you, you respect that, but you don't have to invest energies in showing how good um, another player is. That's something I learned from Andre Lamanis was you, if you're going to show three or four clips of something, show the players what you want them to do or a successful execution of it, even if the video is a bit messy. And that, that's absolutely a, a huge mistake I know I made for years was always stressing so much about trying to get the best clips and good looking clips. It's not about that. It's about getting the key message across so, um, and, and showing people over and over what you want them to do. So um, I won't go into any more. That was just a couple of clips, but I can share this video anyway in, um, in a folder. So, so with Scout Video, keep it short. Keep it to the main themes of the game and, um, and your foundation way of dealing with stuff. There may be some strategic uh, you know, strategic things you go into the game with that maybe you're certain going to deny or bore reversals in that particular game. It might be something that's uh, that, that that you've worked on going into the game, but the the video should ultimately reflect reflect what you have covered in practice. There shouldn't be anything new, um, you know, really in the video when it comes to the concepts. That's great, Nick. Um, and just to see how concise that is, and you're talking about the same thing at NBA level. Um, I know some junior coaches that have shown half an hour of film to their team and it's kind of like, well, how much can they really be taking in? And you're talking about at, at pro level, um, how concise you're making it for the for the athletes. So that's awesome for them to see. Uh, Tim or Hannah, do you want to add anything of, of sort of maybe Tim from your junior yeah, what, perspective? Yeah, of course, we've, you know, with all throughout and the national junior teams and and well, back in when I was with the in the NBL, I remember working with the Falcons. We had the two cassettes <laughs> <laughs> up in the office and near the desk there. And Ken Cole had left his pistol in there. I think at that stage his gun was in the drawer. But there's another story. But the old the old VHS. What I would say is is to reiterate something that Mick said. And um, I think video when you have those video sessions. They're a great opportunity, you know, to show and to educate and practices are different, you know, because you can educate individuals on things and it can be a really, you know, uh, an educational experience, but it can also, you can manipulate your own team psychology. You can mm. be very persuasive by what you show them. As Mick was saying, you can show them another team, a team that you haven't beaten or your team, you might feel like your players are worried about playing them. You can show them, you know, failing. You know, you show them not being successful and you show them that they're quite human and they're fallible. And that you, if you're coming up against a team that you might have a sense of complacency, well, you can show them being really effective. So you can actually manipulate what you show your team to sell the narrative that you want and to promote a particular psychology. And I think um, getting your players in the right mind is such a critical thing as coaches that we're always fostering and nurturing and um, building particular mentalities with our players. And the video is just another opportunity. And so you have to be careful. You don't want to promote, you know, um, gross negativity or you don't want to um, promote overconfidence. You know, you're constantly thinking about what that impacts your you know, the psyche of your group. So what you show is, is important. You have to give that some thought, as Mick was saying. It's, you know, there are, there are other means to other ends here. You know, there are other purposes in this. I think one thing that was a clear oversight too when I was, when I was talking before and it's related to that too is the actual, um, um, when you're trying to influence the group and that is their buy-in, right? So we all know with presentation is, is it questioning? Is it poor? Hey, what do you think next? Like, you know, if you're in that situation, what would be, you know, based on the rules, what, what do we need to do here? Um, you know, and, and changing it up so players are way more engaged. You know, maybe it's some music, it's the odd funny clip, it's whatever it needs to be. So um, it's an enjoyable experience. And that's one thing I have learned. Like in the Australian NBL, you would cover approximately 90 to 100 practice sessions a year across your 28 games or 30 games plus playoffs. So... Um, and no doubt with college that Hannah, Hannah could, 
could talk to. And so the ability to break up the monotony and the routine and make it fun. And so if players walk through the door, drain in their face, kind of, yes, you know, video, let's just get through the, this thing. You know, you, you're climbing up a steep hill to, to recover. So video sessions do need the element of fun, engaging. There'll be times after maybe, you know, when the, you've got to read them the right act or whatever, but generally like you've got to have a fun learning environment if you actually want to get some outcomes out of it. And the players have got to be really engaged in it. Um, so yeah, that's, that, that's something else along those lines. Hannah, have you got anything to sort of add from your maybe experience at college or, or WNBL um, just around film and use of film? Um, at college, also, I think we had to keep it to a maximum of three minutes. Um, our forward scout video uh, review tend to be a little bit longer. Um, personally, I, I sort of probably run the same way. Forward scout would be fairly short and available for them to watch, maybe use huddle or maybe through WhatsApp or whatever, so they can watch it again if they wish. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the review of what we're doing, what we did well, I think the point about not just turning it into a bashing session. Um, of an individual or the group and all the things we didn't do quite right. It's really important to highlight because you want to generate a place of positivity and us, you know, to try and move forward from whether it was a win or a loss. So how you deliver that content, I think is really important in, in review, but I probably would put, I put more time aside for review than I would for um, the forward scout. Something else we do at WNBL, which probably takes a bit more time, is individual scout at Sydney. So I'll sit down with an individual and go through clips, not just of their scores, but maybe of them being in the right spot for the defensive rotation we were trying to get, or maybe not quite being there. And having, instead of, hey, not good enough, you've got to, sometimes that might be a conversation around what was the anomaly in that situation that meant you couldn't be, you know, how can we make that better? If you could do it again, where would you have been? So trying to get dialogue out of it so that I think you get better buy-in when they have an opportunity to discuss and that works better one-on-one -on -one than in front of the group. That's all. Thank Hannah, you. is it fair to say that you, um, in college, you would have what you present to the group, but then obviously the coaching staff would have a way more detailed, you know, report and the videos longer and all that sort of stuff in the process of preparing, preparing for games? Our space, it was interesting. I would present a... So our mentor coach was the guy coaching the LA Sparks that year. So he ended up winning the WNBA championship, but he would fly in. And if it was my scout, so abnormal probably for a GA to be doing any forward scout, but I had four non-conference opposition and two conference. So you would present that to the coaching panel plus Brian Agler. They would grill you and that video might be seven or eight minutes long with everything in it. And then we would, we would compact down what we thought was most important um, to show the group. There was an expectation that you'd watched at least the three games prior in full. And if it was early in the season, the last five games maybe of the season before. Um, so it's pretty comprehensive. But um, early in the season, I was presenting my own scout to the team and I also did the written scout. But um, that's actually an NCAA violation. So they took that away and the coaches started presenting my video. But I still did the written scout. It's very comprehensive, like it's full on, maybe five pages, which I would argue maybe those 20-year-olds were not as across as Reagan might have liked them to be. Oh, that's fantastic. Hopefully that answered uh, your question, Cal. Um, Going to roll into the last couple of questions, which are around sort of talent ID and, and athlete development. Um, so firstly, um, more of a talent ID question. What, what traits do we think are most important when we're sort of selecting and identifying players and then developing them for higher levels? Um, and the question is also asked if you can sort of stay away from physical attributes because we sort of know them, but what do we sort of think of some of those key attributes? I'll have a go. Attitude and work ethic, probably key. Uh, coachability, their ability to, you know, take on whatever it is the instructions are that you're giving them. Maybe that's at a tryout or, or what you observe when you go and watch them if you're scouting. Um, if it's about recruiting to an existing team, I guess it's important that you're making sure that they're fitting your model, which is relevant, I guess, in the college space or in the pro team space. And if it's about building teams, which is probably a bit more relevant to juniors with your tryout process, you want to make sure you're getting the right mix 
of personalities and you know those athletes with all those bits and pieces that that you know you're looking for because if they're not ticking those boxes in attitude and work ethic and they're not working with you as a team inside that team then that's not going to work for you so they're the things I look for Oh, hey, team, I've talked enough, mate. <laughs> Let's say someone go. <laughs> okay. Um, oh, thank you. And I'd say I agree with all those things with Hannah. I think fundamentally competitiveness and motivation, you know, your capacity to assess, are they, are they, in, are they intrinsically motivated? Are they, do they have that competitive drive? Um, and that means to want to test themselves to walk towards pressure, to embrace challenges. I think those sorts of, that sense of the athlete is pretty important. I mean, also you deal with a lot of kids and that come through things and I'm sure we've met them, the kids that are really good and you think, I'm not sure if that kid really wants to do this. You know, I'm not sure if they really love it, if they really want to do that. And, you know, sometimes they're, they're doing what serves their parents. They're doing what serves someone else. So I think that's important to distinguish and recognise them as a, as a young person. And you'll meet the kids that are, you know, so motivated and so passionate about what they want to do. And I think it's, you know, being competitive and being motivated, having a fire within you for something is really important. I also think that you have to assess if a kid can impact the game in some way. And, you know, often we'll go, can they shoot, you know, the... Or, or as coaches, we, we look at what kids can't do and what they can do. You know, we coach on the negative far too often. And, you know, I've been involved with a lot of selection of national junior teams and state teams. And I do despair sometimes that coaches are always talking about what a kid can't do and what they, what they cannot, what they can do. That if a kid can impact a, a, a game in a unique way, if they're a lovely passer, you know, if they've got a, you know, they've got a really knack for something, I reckon that's something we should spot as well. I'm not sure what you think about that, Mick. No, uh, there's so many ways to impact the game. And, yeah. um, and I think I've definitely shifted. Because, I mean, I came through a system like, you know, the old ITC system. And, you know, we had, we had testing. And it was during that um, talent search process where, you know, they'd come to schools, they'd sit, they'd measure yeah. their height. Now, oh, you're going to be a volleyball player. You're going to be a, yeah. you know, these are the sports you should pick from and all that stuff. And I guess... Coaching enough five foot five fiery little players now that, that have been able to compete at a high level, um, and and lots and lots and lots of tall players that haven't been able to. That it's way beyond the athletic ability. I, I would put that um, less as a, a focus and more around like what I talk to people about now is it's the application of the athleticism in games. So you can be a smaller player, you could be you can be whatever, but do you actually apply that athleticism in the game in the right context? And um, I think that's a, that's an important thing when you're watching how people play. Like, and the example I'd use is um, Mick of Akona, who uh, with the Bullets most recently. But you know, he's as the international game of basketball in, in the men's league. I can't comment on, on the women's; I just don't know it well enough. But in, in the men's side, there's been this whole thing around, you know seven foot plus for the five spot they've got to be able to shoot it these days and you know it's not far off seven foot at the four spot and so on so forth Mick of a cone is six foot five and he he has been for the better part of a decade and in an impactful and solid good starting international basketball player and it just gets you thinking about well what is it you know and well, when you talk about what a great point game, that's a great point because you know, that, you know, and it happens to be, he's one of my favourite all-time players in, in the NBL um, for that reason. Because, yeah, he takes what he has and, you know, he, he does utilise it. And, and part of that, I think, is he's, he's motivated. He has a fire in him. And I think they, they kind of go hand in glove, those things, that capacity to impact and a desire to figure out a way to do it, you know. Yeah. I'm not sure what you think about that. Because no, if, if you if you if you said if you looked at him and you're saying like being a bit like we're coaches, we have critical eyes. So you could go, well, he's a guy that he can't shoot it. He doesn't yeah. really have a left hand. He, 
And you, you know, you, like you could easily go down, steer yourself down that path that you've chosen to steer down. Whereas yeah. if you can just take a step back when you're assessing talent and really look at uh, what, what's going on in this game around who is impacting it and why is it because it's a, a good passer or a phenomenal rebounder or they are a really good scorer of, of the basketball or a great on-ball defender. Um, so there's, there's definitely those, those primary skills or, or the DNA of that player that can help them um, be successful. So I think that's really important thing as coaches when we assess talent. And then I guess the two other things, um, I call it obviously decision-making. So again, you can be really skillful or underskilled, but if you can make good decisions often, um, and particularly under pressure, I think we talked about poise before. So can you look at a basketball game as a coach and critique the decisions that are being made? Did they pass to space? Was it too late? Now, the pass may or may not have been accurate, but was the decision the right decision at the time? Did they see the weak side of the floor? So I think decision-making has got to be a paramount thing um, when it comes to, 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 to selecting athletes for, for teams. And then the last one is the old off-camera attitude. So, you know, you get just as much learnings from a game that goes to overtime or right down to the wire and there's lots of energy in the building and you can see who rises to the occasion or who struggles in that environment as the 30-point blowout where um, our kids, whether they're up or they're down, do they still offer things that contribute to the team? So uh, do they sit on the bench, take their shoes off early and check out? Are they still cheering for their team when their team's up 20 or 30? Uh, do they not actually give up when they're still down, down 20 or 30? So there's always interesting things to look at towards the end of the game, um, regardless of what the, the score line is. I, fi I find that kind of off-camera stuff um, pretty, pretty important. No. Brilliant stuff from, from all coaches on the panel. That's great insight. Um, I'm going to throw to Jared Moore, who's got a couple of questions in a similar vein. Coaches, thanks for your time so far. Um, what I'd like to know, what are some strategies to sell long-term athlete development to an athlete who is hyper-competitive and wants to win now? Well, it's nothing wrong with right? Like we all want to win. Um, I guess it's, it's that win versus learn. And the, the, the perfect formula of that is achieving both. You want them to be learning and, and striving towards that win, I guess, at the same time. Um, I think an element of this is probably the coach themselves, but simplistically, I mean, yeah, in the simplest terms, you can run a zone because you've got the biggest, scariest looking team and force, you know, the 12 year olds you're playing against to not be able to score because they can't reach the three-point line. Or you could teach your big guys to be able to play, I guess, the game a bit more holistically. And it might cost you some games earlier, but you're developing basketball as long-term. I guess that's dumbing it all the way back down to, to the little kids. But I guess for that kid individually, I'd be trying to find examples of players like them. You know, so at the pro, you know, you're, you're striving to be your best. You want to win now. I'd be trying to find examples in the pros, college, that might have the same physical attributes that are striving, that maybe give them something to focus on or aspire to be like. Um, and I guess also start to think a little bit about the process rather than just, you know, whatever your, your lofty ambition might be. I think having a focus on, on process rather than outcome is going to help those kids, I guess, stay on task. Anything else to add, uh, Tim or Mick, on that one? Another hour's worth, but anyway. Let... <laughs> um, <laughs> you go, Tim, if you got. Uh, well, I'd, 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 I'd go back to a saying that um, uh, Adrian would say, um, and that is the, the idea is uh, when, we, when we would, the story of the team, you come to practice, and Adrian was very even coach. And um, as a coach, I thought one of his great strengths was to not get too high or too low. He had a very even temperament. And for players like that, and, you know, um, it's carry water, chop wood. You do do your thing every, each day and be patient and carry your water, chop your wood. And those sorts of things are, are to, to promote that, um, that what way you get to is a, is comes about of the result of your process, as Hannah was saying and to disappear inside that somehow 
and to create environments where that's what your focus is as a coach. Because if you, you, um, you um, emulate or sort of you, you display those sorts of characteristics yourself, if you are focused on the here and now as a coach with those athletes, there's a good chance that they will also be focused on the here and now to carry their water, to chop their wood, and then to, to show them, as Hannah said, it's a great example of, to show them um, ex exemplars of that. You know, who else has been like that? This player was like that and look what they can become. And also there's a great saying to become the player you should become, you know? Um, so I think it's of the same notion. I hope, I hope that helps a bit, Jared. Jared and I, it's, a, it's a tricky one, isn't it, to, to how we sell that. But if, again, if the player has the right mind, the right sort of motivation to get there, and if the player is sort of um, of that mindset, then they're interested in learning. And again, you coaches have a, a part of creating that culture of learning. You know, if we, if we model um, behaviours which are, are like that, about the here and now and not about long-term, then chances are our players will be like that too, and especially the young ones. We do, we do have to model this right sort of thinking for them um, in our roles as, as coaches. So it's incumbent upon, upon us, we, you know, to, to, um, to develop that. Mick, do you want to add anything or you want to Jared to roll into his second question? Yeah. Yeah, no, jump to the next one. That's good. Thank you, Jared. That was excellent, uh, Tim and Hannah. Thank you. Uh, for my next question, how do you build confidence in players who aren't having much success at the present moment but have the skills and potential to be great? We kind of talked a little bit about some of the things that I think are relatable to this question just before. I think that um, the players that second guess themselves or they just, they just don't show their full personality on the basketball court. You know, they do, you know, every player deals with, with confidence issues, no matter how good they are. So how do you build it? I think continually ring, reinforcing with them um, what their greatest strengths are and how that's actually valuable to the group. And like I talked about Mika Vakona before and, you know, he actually can score the ball a little bit in the, in the New Zealand league. If he plays, he'll be more of a scorer. But um, the fact that he may miss key free throws in games isn't going to impact whether or not he goes for the next offensive rebound or, um, you know, defends the next pick and roll really well. And so the, the kids that lack confidence, I guess it's important for them to not, to, to have a mechanism of, um, and a group of people that support them, ideally some teammates, but the coach, we have a role in this around them understanding that there's so many things that can be done in the game that aren't skill related that can still have a positive impact in the game. So I would shift um, the focus a bit more around some effort things and also continually remind them about the, the things or the one or two things that they actually do really well. Um, that helps the team. Because I think kids lose sight of that very quickly. When uh, I mean, the most common one is when they, they miss shots, right? Kids, kids miss shots, they put their head down. The snowball effect of, you know, they don't talk on D, they, the body language, you know, they, the, the theatre of the game, they, they, they react to something because they see that on TV and that's what you're supposed to do when you miss a shot. So, and we know as coaches, all that stuff hurts. It hurts, you know, being able to stay in the moment, perform, what's your job right now? So I think it's, um, it's important uh, with these players just to keep helping them redirect their focus around the things that they are capable of doing, that whether they make shots or miss shots or whatever the thing is that that is a mechanism for them to drop their confidence, that they still have a whole group of things that they can do to contribute and they feel valued in, um, in the, team's, the team's performance. I think that's... Uh, I think that's a really, really big one. That's right. That's right, Mick. Because then, then you you tell the story of the, if the story of the team says that we value that. This is one of the things that we believe in, and this is this helps us survive. This is what gives us life as a team. And then if it's acknowledged, and you know, c coaches are smart enough to acknowledge that and accentuate that thing, 
And like we get, you catch a, a naughty kid doing a good thing at school, and if a kid misbehaves a lot, and when you catch them being good and doing something well, it's amazing if you if you can tell them that, that can help bring about that change. You know, so accentuating the positive, telling the story, tell the narrative of how that fits in to the fabric of the team. And if you overlook it, then you've overlooked one of their strengths. Yeah. I'd say, so and like, I think that's the most important thing, but really highlighting um, specific examples of practice. So here's one that we, we would do um, is when we scrimmage and play at, at training and then in games with it, we stat this stuff as well. But um, looking at, um, we talk about splits all the time or creating advantage. And so people often focus on, is it the guy with the ball, the player with the ball in their hand, you know, did they get a blow by? Or is it a pick and roll where they created an advantage? But, you know, you can create the advantage by a really hard cut or holding your spacing and then hunting like you're going to receive the basketball for a shot. And so there's so many ways that a player, without having to do maybe somewhat of the highly skilled things using pick and roll, that they can actually impact have a direct impact on the outcome of the possession by just holding space, cutting hard, setting a great screen. And, but if you and, and don't that value brings that. Me to that point, no, Nick, that can't. point that Hannah made earlier about enhancing the role of the assistant coach. And I think Hannah said that assistant coach can enhance. So the assistant coach is switched on in the, in the videos and that comment about, did you see that cut? Did you see what we did there? And even on the bench, the assistant coach says that play was set up by that cut there and the team starts to be educated about that. And I think that's a great moment for assistant coaches to sort of, you know, to, um, yeah, to enhance the team in that regard and to reinforce, uh, a, you know, the recognition of something like that. Anna, have you got anything to add on that? Um... Only a little, and I guess it basically is just in summary. It's, it's ba I'm basically in agreement with what they've already said. Just basically shifting and broadening, I guess, your measures of success and perhaps the team's measure of success as well. Um, as the coach, you want to be on that journey of improvement with them and I guess celebrate those successes, which is basically what the guys have been saying too. Like you want to find, like, the word success, I think, is is the is the red flag there for me. Like if, if they're not having success, then you need to shape what success looks like so that we can start to build from somewhere. Like, and I think success is often about how many points I've scored, but there are so many other ways to celebrate it. And as Tim pointed out, as an assistant, that's a really great space to be able to work in and build guys up or girls up on the bench. No, brilliant. Great stuff. Um, last about formal questions. It's certainly, um, uh, been great discussion. Um, Clayton Lyons uh, has got a question. Uh, thanks, Reese. Um, just in regards to um, player development at all levels, um, I coach VJBL uh, with the Werribee program um, and also I'm involved in the junior girls in Big V as an assistant this year to Mason. Um, and one of the things that is discussed at the club a lot is around uh, positionless basketball. Um, so my question to all three coaches is um, positionless basketball is an emphasis of all, if not most, junior development programs around the country. Um, in effect, um, around the world. You watch a lot of YouTube videos and a lot of coaching videos in Europe, and they always talk about positionless basketball. So my main question is, what, if any, um, are the impacts on a player's ability to progress successfully through the representative programs, VJBL, SDP, Big V, NBL, um, if players are not exposed to playing and developing skills in all five positions throughout their, you know, under 14s, under 16s, under 18 um, campaigns? Who wants to start off? I'm happy to. Let me get my little vent out the road. <laughs> um, we've been multi-skilling athletes as part of our curriculum in um, various um, labelling of the ITC, NPP, SP, you know, all the different names it's had over the years um, for the last 30-odd years plus. Um, and so 
Obviously, positionless basketball is an in vogue, trendy, current brand that's been, um, uh, I guess, adopted and and infiltrated the coaching coaching uh, and basketball ranks. But the thing I would challenge is, like, it's not like the the court dimensions are the same. Everything's the same. The number of players are the same. And it's not whether you label a player with a one or a two or you call them a point guard or a shooting guard. I think what gets missed is the semantics on what a positionless player is or a positionless system is versus highly skilled players. And I think that's where, like, our... Our, our duty as coaches and, and some influence with administrators is around like refocusing the energies around how can we continue to develop highly skilled players because um, granted maybe 30, 40 years ago, it was a bit more traditional around what a five man did. You know, there was no yeah. such thing as a shooting big um, or, you know, first there became a bit of a stretch. You were a stretch forward and now they're like a highly skilled forward and fives, you know, didn't stretch to the three-point line, but now they can. So I understand what people are saying is that regardless of height or whatever, you've got to be able to, you know, shoot the basketball, dribble the basketball, pass the basketball. So I think when it comes to being in the trenches with the kids themselves and the sort of the messages that you're giving them is 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 less about, um, I mean, you've, you can come up with sexy names. Replace the one with the word attacker. Replace the two two with the word sniper or you know, something associated with driller, shooter. Like you can change the five to a, a rim, a runner or a paint runner. Like you can come up with sexy labels that are adopted around the world to, to get buying. But um, don't lose sight of the fact that what are the skills that kids need to continue to develop to be able to actually move on in the game? And um, I think that's got to be an important part of your environment when you look at, look at the players and go, right, where are you at now? What do you do well? What can we continue to work on and chip away at to improve? But long term, what's going to be the plan to help you read the game and to be able to execute good decisions? So execute skill after reading the game well, um, so that's transferable to, to different programs. So then, when you get challenged from other coaches or selectors of state teams or whatever, and they're like, "Well, you know, they're not really a five or whatever," well, it's like, "Well, hang on, they may not be a five, but they do." Da 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 da. A B C D. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's it's important to understand your athletes around you know, what, what contributions. And often it's those, um, those things we were talking about before, you know, like all the different positive impacts they can have in a game. Um, so I think that's important, uh, having the focus more around the skill component of it as opposed to whatever the brand of that's in at the moment because that will change in two or three years' time. It'll be called something different. Yeah. That's, my, that's my rant anyway because that's, that's, that's a lot at the moment with uh, the round. It's everywhere. So... I'm pretty much in almost complete agreement with that. I think there's a real need to be dynamic, whether you're playing positionless or whether I'm the five man. Like I need to have extra bits and pieces in my tool belt. And I guess, so sure, positionless basketball, it's highly relevant. And as you said, the five man is stretching further and further out or they talk about the, the point post. He or she is needing to be able to facilitate now too. Like gone are the day. Like they just, they, they're... We're required to be more versatile. But that said, if you're trying to make any given team, you need to bring something that you're an expert at. You need to be really good at something that nobody else that's in this space can do. And I guess if you're just kind of okay at everything, yeah, I'm not sure if that makes you that guy or that girl that's, that's taking those next steps. So by all means, as a five man, I can dribble the ball at the floor. Like I saw the center for the Flyers this year, Mercedes Russell, Early in the season, it was all back to the basket. By the end of it, like she was triggering the break. She's six foot, I don't know, eight. She's huge. But she was, you know, getting more confident and I guess being able to evolve her position, which made it very difficult for us to stop her. That said, she's really good under the basket. Like she's really refined those skills. So although you want to be able to do stuff in roles from the one man through to the five don't lose sight of the fact that you need to be an expert in something to take the next step you need anything to add yeah it's an interesting one i think um uh, i i I agree that you know you focus on developing highly skilled players and developing players that are adept at making you know, good decisions and the psychology of players, their capacity to compete, 
to move on from a mistake. I think that's really, um, if, if you're focusing on those aspects, then the system is okay, whatever, because as we said, the system keeps changing, you know, and the styles of basketball. So what we, we need to do is keep giving the players the necessary skills, physical skills, and uh, the mental skills to be able to compete, and respond and to adapt um, and their relationships that really that's where it's at. And then, um, uh, then they can go and manage whatever comes their way because, you know, um, that, that uh, ability to be flexible and to adapt, you know, I, I do think we, we overlook the development of the, sometimes the, the mental skills of the players, you know, that the thinking, the, the capacity to be resilient, you know, and I know that one of the things that I'm, I'm most interested in, be interested to see if the other coaches are interested in that is work around positive visualisation, you know, for our young athletes as well. I think um, a lot of these kids are, you know, dealing with a lot of anxieties or there's so many kids coming up with anxiety about performance and worrying about things and comparing themselves to other people. I think there's a space for us as coaches to, you know, to get in and think about and how we can help our our young players and our older players and professional players, a lot of them master this stuff. They have these worries about things and we really need ways to, to help them do that. So without getting too bogged down on just slotting someone in the what develop the athlete as a whole, you know, and think about that, not just whether they can play that position, but how's their decision-making, their thinking, their relationships, um, their competitiveness. Anyway. Coach, did any of the – Mick or Hannah, did you, do you want to touch on Tim's point or have a comment on Tim's point around positive visualisation, imagery? Just it reinforces me. I think in this superficial world, superficial relationships through social media platforms and, and again, it's not any, it's the world. We have to accept it, that that's the, the world that these kids exist in and the world that they – you know, the lens that they see the world through is through that the, all those platforms. So – um, we need to find ways to understand that and not allow it to detract from if they're wanting to play sport and play sport at, at a high level, that there's just certain foundation things that need to occur for them to be able to enjoy the experience because they mm. can be good at it. And it's a real issue with the anxiety and, and that we have some great chats with our mental skills coach here um, you know, around that cognitive flexibility and a, whole, and, and a whole bunch of stuff that he... He talks about like some foundation skills that every human needs, but visual positive visualization is a big one because there's so much framing of negative things uh, around the world now. So, and um, you know, kids having to compare themselves to the, the best clothes, the best, you know, the, the the most popular people, and all that sort of stuff. So, um, yeah, it's a big one. They've got to come into the come into the gym feeling good about themselves that they can actually do well in that environment. Because there's so many ways, there's so many outs now um, to, to not see the full full potential of kids. Thanks, guys. I appreciate all your answers. They're really in depth, um, and probably the, one of the things that I've taken out of um, tonight's meeting is you all revert back to the same thing, and that is um, you've got to look at who the players are in your teams, what their strengths and weaknesses are, and then develop those strengths and weaknesses for whatever the reasons are. So, thank you very much, guys. Cheers. Fantastic. Um, that was the last formal question. And because I budgeted about 45 minutes for the, uh, the formal <laughs> questions, uh, which obviously not enough, um, which Hannah kind of pointed out this morning when I spoke to her, she thought it might be, I might be cutting it fine. But um, so we won't take any more from the floor. Unfortunately, a couple have come through, but I'll reward those guys and girls that got their coaches, their questions in early. Um, so they got theirs through. But I want to throw it to, to Mick. Tim and Hannah, if you guys possibly had a question for each other or something you wanted to discuss amongst yourselves if you got time, or you know, if you had a parting remark or advice for the, the coaches that are on this call. Uh, really, I mean, it, coaching is, is a process, right? It sounds a little bit cliched, but I guess if you take anything away from any of these clinics, I've sat in on a few 
with, with a variety of speakers now is, is, you know, we're forever evolving and the game is, you know, so at the moment flow and um, what the Opals are running, nearly every team, the WNBL is running a form a, a something similar that'll evolve into whatever the next thing is. I can remember back in the day coaching in junior, nearly everybody just ran the shuffle. Um, it's probably 20 years ago now, but you know, these things come in swings and roundabouts and I guess you've just got to find what works for you. But um you can always put like get better and I think as our kids are I mean you guys talked about the the mental side of things um, it's becoming you know nearly every coach at the college level will try to convince you that they're relationship driven that's not something that you can fake if you can get good at building genuine relationships with your players whatever you're running and whatever it is that you're trying to achieve you're going to get maximum success so I guess yeah that's my it's great Timmy, yeah. Nick, I'm not sure what to what to ask. I mean, I'm really enjoying I'm really enjoying listening to Hannah and Mick and what they have to say, and um, I just really I find coaching intellectually stimulating and challenging, and it's part of why I'm still doing it. Um, and the, one of the first questions was, how can you help in your club? you know coach another one it's just part of what we should do you know that's that's it you know it's part of the fraternity um of coaching and it's incumbent on us to to share and to listen and to keep helping the next kid along and to promote more coaches you know young girls and guys who want to become coaches and those players are there and they might you know they might not be the best players on the team and they might but let's pick some of those and let's get great people coming through into the service of coaching and do what you can to pass on what you know to somebody else and pay it forward. That's, I think that's what we do. And I, you know, and I, tonight I sort of think of all those wonderful coaches. I've named a few, but there's all these wonderful coaches who I've coached with and coached alongside. And I saw Al McGaughtry's name there and all these amazing people that I've become friends with over the years and we are in that great fraternity together and it doesn't matter where we are in Victoria or Queensland or over in New Zealand, doesn't matter. I've got a great friend right now. There's a Greek guy coaching in China and another friend who's in Italy, you know, so that it's just awesome, the world of basketball. So, and so thanks a lot for having me on and to be able to share it all with you. So I really appreciate it. Oh, we appreciate it, Tim, and it's a great point. Nick, any, any parting words or thoughts? No, I've spoken enough tonight. I appreciate appreciate if you invest your time like coming on coming on these things is is great. Like where I mean I can't speak for Hannah and Tim, but I get equally nervous, excited, and like I love um I guess I love the the self imposed pressure on um just being around a group of coaches and and, and, and talking shop and sharing the game. So uh the only advice I would say is like you know, it's sport and it's basketball and like in the context of the broader stuff in life, like really it's not that serious. So um, if you can just enjoy the journey and enjoy the experience, you know, as you continue to get older and older, you'll, you'll have a smile on your face and you'll, you'll still be entrenched in the game. So I think um, just that ongoing mindset of just enjoying to learn and finding the good in the experience, because there will be difficult things. Getting fired my first year as a pro coach in Perth. I had a multi-year contract. We made the playoffs. We lost in a home court. I got reviewed by the, the, the independent consultant, got told I did a fantastic job, and then said, oh, we're moving in a different direction. And that was a really awesome moment in my career where I'd spent 10, 15 years trying to get to the NBL. I got there, and then I got fired after the first year. Now, I got an olive branch with another team, but... Um, what that taught me was you just can't take stuff too seriously. You've got to enjoy it while you're there and you never know when the ride's finished. So um, keep doing these things, do the things that, that, that bring enjoyment and fulfillment for you and uh, you'll be able to do it for, for a long time. Uh, absolutely fantastic. Great points. Um, Nick, Anna, Tim, uh, can't thank you guys enough for giving up, you know, a couple of hours on a, Thursday night to help us out and, and the, the bunch of coaches that jumped on and we know there'll be a lot that'll watch it back um, but to 
when I sort of thought of this concept of having the q and I couldn't have imagined how well it's gone. I think the dialogue and the discussion has been great, the engagement from, from coaches and just some, some great ideas and thought provoking things for, for coaches to leave this from. So really, really appreciate your time. Um, it's, it's been awesome. Thanks everybody. Thanks a lot, Reese. Thanks, Thanks Hannah. Thanks Mick. All the best. I will flag for us if I can get my screen up who we're going to have next week. You're going to go back to the more traditional presentation. Um, just give me one second, guys. Sorry, a bit slow. Um, struggling. Um, just for next week, but I would like some feedback if we want to do another Q and A, and if we want it to be on a specific topic, let me know because um, we are going to run until about uh, number fourteen. We've got someone lined up for week 14. It's going to be pretty special. But I just want to show um, who we're going to have next week. So next week, we're lucky to have um, Jamie O'Loughlin from Cairns Taipans. He's going to present on pick and roll uh, offense and trends at the, the pro level. And then we've got Liam Flynn, who's back. And he's going to present on um, defense and the next defense concept as well. So uh, it's going to be some good stuff. A bit more tactical and technical. Um, but, yeah. Hope to see you guys there and thanks for engaging again and and massive thanks to to the panel. It was awesome presentations. Thanks everyone. Good night. All right, thanks for having us. Thanks, thanks guys. You.